A Time to Kill A Study Concerning the Use of Force and Abortion by Rev. Michael Bray Dedication To Him be glory in the Church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Ephesians 3.21 The Church of the Living God is the pillar of truth, according to the Apostle Paul. It is that glorious community of holy ones which continues to proclaim the truth and lighten the way for mankind down through the ages. It is the church of God through which the true God, the triune God, is glorified in the earth. This book is dedicated to my own church, Reformation Lutheran Church of Bowie, Maryland. It is these people, a true community of saints, whom God has used to nourish and sustain me and my family. It is this community which has supplied me the time and support to write what is needed to be written. Michael Bray, Bowie, Maryland, October 1993. Acknowledgements. Verbum de mene eternum. It is an ancient truth. The word of God abides forever. This general truth is not hard to proclaim. The difficulty is in its application to the particular issues of the time. Intellectual honesty will lead one to this, but inspiration is needed for the proclaiming of it. I have taken inspiration recently from the examples of Christian leaders who have taken a strong stand for the defense of unborn children, even when it has cost them much. I have been prompted ever onward by the good example of the growing number of Christian convicts and their supporters. Also, thanks to Kip Gannett, my fellow church member, who has faithfully heralded the cause of the unborn for over a decade. I am in debt to the many reviewers of the manuscript, theologians, writers, pro-life leaders, and pastors, some who agree and others who were kind in sharing their opposition in order to make the issues of the debate more clear. Only a few of those who took time to read and rest with the subject at hand were pastors John Rogers, Jerry Probst, and Michael Colvin. Also, I extend my gratitude to pro-life activists John Cavanaugh O'Keefe, Paul DePerry, and Don Stover. Special thanks is also due Dr. Carl Laney of Western Conservative Baptist Seminary, who afforded careful criticism of the style as well as theological content. No publisher but the modestly endowed Advocates for Life publications had the holy temerity to probe the subject of this book. I thank the Lord for my publisher, Andrew Burnett, for his courage and commitment to the truth. I am heartily grateful to my editor, Kathy Ramey. Without her patience and perseverance, this endeavor would not have reached its end. Finally, and to the utmost, I thank my wife and best friend, Janie. In her, I have been supplied all I need in a helpmate. Preface It was a cold February night in 1984, according to the court testimony of one of the defendants. Two men drove from Bowie, Maryland in a yellow Honda and preparations were made to travel to Dover, Delaware, despite the ominous weather conditions. The necessary supplies had been loaded into the car, a cinder block for the window, gasoline, and matches. Shortly after crossing the Bay Bridge, one must drive over another short bridge to Kent Island. The ice on the bridge that night was hidden with a thick fog. An accident had already occurred, and the yellow Honda fell victim too. With the front end smashed in, and the gasoline container still intact, the two continued the journey to the goal. The mission was not abandoned. Before daybreak, the only abortion chamber in Dover was gutted by fire and put out of the business of butchering babies. May 13, 1985, was the date that my bombing trial began. Seven abortion facilities in Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, and DC had been destroyed in 1984, totaling $1 million in damages. I was one of three defendants charged with conspiracy, the only one to go to trial. Seventeen months later, a jury upheld the prosecutor's charges.
No juror recognized a legitimate legal ground for a citizen to defend the preborn by forceful means. I was sentenced in connection with the destruction of the Dover abortuary, along with six other facilities of abortion, and imprisoned in a federal correctional institution from July of 1985 until May 15, 1989. I don't know if anyone else saw the irony, but in the headline news across the nation that day was the bombing of the houses of MOVE members by police in Philadelphia. The Back to Nature group, I'll avoid cult, suffered the loss of six adults and five children. 61 homes were destroyed. Police had dropped an explosive device from a helicopter, setting buildings on fire. Subsequent to the outbreak of the fire, city officials determined to let the fire burn in order to forcefully evacuate the recalcitrant inhabitants. Three years later, a grand jury completed its investigation and decided not to prosecute any city officials. Who can rightfully use force and when? The response from pro-life leaders around the country in 1984 and 1985 was condemnation of the acts of demolishing abortion facilities. In my community, there were many who came to my side and a number of my supporters stood with me on the assumption that I had not performed the deeds charged to me. I was a respectable fellow of good reputation. Only a few took the opportunity to defend the action and thus proclaim the preborn worthy of serious defense efforts. George Eurician, one who had worked voluntarily as an advocate for the unborn for at least a decade, wrote letters to the local papers and sent a hundred copies of the following to pro-life associates. 8th March 1985 Dearest friends, During the past year a lot has been said and written about abortion chamber bombings and about the subject of violence. With the bombing trials of three Maryland men forthcoming, we shall be reading and hearing a lot more starting with this letter. Thank you. Prominent in the furor over the bombings has been the use of the words violence and nonviolence. The terms, as they say, need to be defined. Boy, do they. Violence is a somewhat ambiguous word that has several legitimate dictionary uses. However, it has become a trendy term fashionable throughout society in general, not just within the context of the abortion debate. And the new use of the word is very narrow, a use that often, if you will, does violence to the traditional definition. When applied to human affairs, the fashionable use of the word violence is always bad, and conversely, nonviolence is always good. Destroying an abortion chamber is, arguably, an act of violence. Therefore, when pro-lifers publicly condemn violence, they appear to be condemning the destruction of abortion chambers, as well as those who destroy them. How can a right to lifer do that? The fact is, violence per se is morally neutral. Unlike greed, lust, or hate, it is not of itself evil, nor is nonviolence per se virtuous. Violence is wrong when it's wrongful violence. And nonviolence is wrong when a father refrains from using physical force while watching a maddened Doberman attack his child. If all violence were evil, almost every worker in the world would be a villain. Butchers, harvesters, laborers, householders, white collars, they tear and crumple paper all day long. Those who use force on other humans, soldiers, police, doctors, nurses, Parents. Was David violent when he slew Goliath? Were Joan of Arc and the several monarch saints who led armies into battle violent? Was Jesus violent when he expelled the money changers? Are abortion chamber sitters nonviolent when they do violence to the ordinary best business of the chambers? Are pro life activists nonviolent when they do violence to the tranquility? of the abortionists. Very truly yours, George Eurician. 
The bombers of 1984 and 1985 were jailed, and not much more was said about the issue. Operation Rescue began in 1988 to capture the forefront of the public abortion debate, and Christians wrestled with the issue of whether or not to break the law non-violently by sitting in front of an abortion facility door. Many thousands did. With the advent of Michael Griffin, discussion over the legitimacy of the use of force has been brought pell-mell to the fore. On March 10, 1993, Michael Griffin fatally shot abortionist David Gunn as he was going toward the door to, quote, go to work at his Pensacola abortuary. Twelve babies missed their appointments with death on that day. What's a pro-lifer to do? How can a pro-lifer defend the taking of life? And yet how can he deny that children were saved? Then on a hot summer evening in August of the same year, when it appeared that the debate was dying down, along came Rochelle Shannon, a housewife from Grants Pass, Oregon. She traveled to Wichita to shoot the notorious church-going, late-term abortionist George the Killer Tiller. She shot him in both arms, sharpening the debate all the more. Some folks could acknowledge the use of force, theoretically, to defend babies because they are human, after all. But, they objected, hadn't Griffin gone too far? Hadn't he used excessive force? The action of Mrs. Shannon, only wounding the abortionist, called the bluff of some and stiffened the resolve of others. With this book, let the continuing pro-life education campaign also include a vigorous discussion of intervention without ignoring the use of godly force.